Welcome to the San Jose Hockey Now podcast. I'm Sheng Peng, Editor-in-Chief of San Jose Hockey Now. You can also find my work at Twitter at Sheng underscore Peng and at MEC Sharks. And I'm Keegan McNally. You can find me on Twitter at half underscore hockey or at my website half-wallhockey.com or at San Jose Hockey Now. We have a very exciting episode this week, Sheng. Very exciting, yes. Uh, we have Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy from the eye test on this podcast. A couple weeks ago, both Pierre and Jimmy said some maybe unflattering things uh, about the San Jose Sharks uh, rebuild on the March 20th episode of the eye test. And so we talked with Pierre and Jimmy about that today, had a little bit of debate. It was a very, very good conversation. So we're really excited for you to hear it. It was. It's good to get some perspective from the outside the the San Jose hockey world, and it was awesome to talk with those two guys. Uh, a little bit of a debate. It got tight and a little heated for a second, but it was a. It was, <laughs> it was a just debate. a misunderstanding. All right. Yeah, it was a misunderstanding, and I think. Um, yeah, you guys should listen to it. It's a, it's a great, uh, almost a full hour of an interview with them. So I'm, yeah. I'm really grateful for their time uh, on our podcast. Um, this week. Uh, we're going to talk, we're a little bit delayed this week, but we're going to talk about a few games uh, from the Sharks um, and to highlight a few players, Mackenzie Blackwood and Clem Costin, uh, Clem Costin, uh, <laughs> as well as talk about um, the upcoming Frozen Four and a little bit of the play of Will Smith in the um, preliminary rounds. Um, we're going to talk about Philip Bistat joining the Barracuda, hopefully soon, um, and the Jack Studnika uh, recall to the Sharks as well. Mm -hmm. okay so yeah let's talk about the games uh well, they got one win so that's nice good for them they they, they need to get a, a couple wins there also too uh one thing uh that um i found interesting is um i wrote an article recently uh what the sharks have to do to <clears throat> do to avoid being the worst team of the salary cap era mm -hmm. worst team of salary cap era is the detroit red wings 2019 20 with a 275 points percentage um the sharks uh, when i wrote the article they had 40 points and they were at i think a 282 points per or 278 points percentage right and so for them to avoid uh uh, uh being uh, worse than the the red wings they just need six points the rest of the season i think it was with 10 games left so uh three three wins and 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 10 games which is actually a lot to ask of this team of course a little but, bit yeah but, but uh I, what i found funny though is so many responses like i was just keep losing just keep losing and i was like guys the Sharks have 40 points. The Blackhawks, the 31st team, have 47 points. You can win three games and not have the matter. distinction of being the worst salary cap team ever. And you'll still have the best draft lottery odds. You know, a reminder, once again, you don't get more lottery balls if you lose more games. I wish you did, though. <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> if that's the case, then that's fine, all right? But uh, mm -hmm. that's not the case, though. As the Sharks have a... Even the one game that they won was on the same night that the Blackhawks won a game. And so the Blackhawks are still uh, seven points ahead of the Sharks with, I think, right now we have seven games left or something like that. So the Sharks yeah. are in pretty good shape here, okay? And so anyway, I just found that a, a very, a very amusing. Um, so people not in love with the math as much as uh, as, as I, I am, were, apparently. Uh... Yeah, I think we were all kind of stuck in this uh, pre-Bedard mode for the Blackhawks, where they were like neck and neck for the worst team. Oh, in the sure, NHL last and, year, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. well, no, I mean like even when Bedard was out, and now that he's oh, back, yeah, sure, it's sure, like sure. they're better than us. So like yeah. they're probably gonna finish. <laughs> they're probably gonna finish higher. Like, to be yeah, honest, that's, that's, they 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 looks like they are. Yeah, they're they're well they're well ahead toward it. I think the remaining schedule. It's a popular topic of conversation among uh sharks beat writers like yeah you know i think uh it'd be nice to see a couple more wins here get uh devin cooley a win in san jose maybe have like an upset win to feel good about over a good team look it's it's tough for, for, for us, uh, after yeah. a game. I mean, I know complaining about a job that, I mean, really a great job. I, I love it, but, uh, it's tough, it's tough to talk to, to players after loss, after loss, after loss, you know, they know it, you know, it, it's just, it's hard. What questions do you ask? Uh, um, you know, so many answers we've received this season are along the lines of, we're just not a very good team. They don't say it, but we're, <laughs> we're just not a very good team. You ask why we didn't do this, why we didn't execute this, why, 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 why we couldn't hold that third period lead. Well, Shang, we're just not a very good team. Yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, so so it's yeah, hard. It's, it's been a slog of a season. 
<laughs> end of the season or end of this uh season is like a it's a mercy it really is it, whenever it, it comes it is it is it is uh i i've joked uh you guys have seen that mark jackson meme uh you know whatever happened to the whatever happened to this game that i love sometimes i watch the sharks out there and i ask myself <laughs> that <laughs> because i That's miss sad. i miss covering good hockey uh I when know. we do see good play from guys like we're gonna talk about clean costing and mackenzie blackwood and we've seen it from Bortolo and eklund that is very really nice uh, uh some kind of a uh, uh, kind of oasis, you know, in, in, mm-hmm. a, in a really uh, a long season. But yeah, it's it's been a hard season, guys. Like this this team is really really bad. Uh, they are their record, um, and so uh, hopefully next year will be a marginal improvement, which we're going to talk about with Pierre and Jimmy. Uh, just like what they need to do to kind of get the on the ice product. You know, we know the big picture is going in the right direction in terms of the draft picks and the prospects have had most of them. Uh, the recent picks have had good years, right? Uh, we know that's headed in the right direction, but the on the ice product it can't be this bad. So anyway, yeah. let's talk about some of the, the bright spots though. Um, so clean costing. So yep. Of course, I have serious reservations always about guys who put up points in the season and the season hockey. Uh, you're playing against teams that are out of it, like the Kraken, uh, like yourself, or you're playing against teams like the Dallas Stars or whatever that have established their position and aren't fighting for much, right? And they 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 spot you six three leads and then they want to turn it on. They <laughs> and they and and they, and, they, and they win the game. They take the game from you, and so yeah. um, so it's not always the best judge of of, of a player. So I don't want to get I say that because I don't want fans to get too excited about what we're seeing over over Costin. You know, people are already uh, saying, "Oh, he's going to be a part of the rebuild." Blah blah blah. No, no idea. He he has a ways to go. Go go still. Um, David Quinn mm-hmm. said actually very flat out that he's got to you know kind of up the conditioning just a little bit. No one's saying he's out of shape, but you know, can he stand up be a little leaner, which will make him faster on the ice? Yes. And so if he does take steps like that, then okay, maybe that shows that he wants to be part of the solution here. And instead of just kind of uh, being just good enough. Right. And so you want guys that want to be better than who they are that to not just for your team. So he, so, so they can bring the team uh, make the team better, but also bring your prospects up too. And be, you want positive examples around your William Ecklins and Thomas Borlows. And so I, I, so I do want to say that about, about, about clean, like let's kind of, slow it down a little bit with with him uh but yeah uh from the very beginning we've seen the uh, guy that is huge but not only just huge but he's skilled he's has good hands uh he looks good on the power play not that he's going to be a pp1 guy but when he moves the puck he's comfortable with it he knows when to hold it he knows when to move it uh and away from sort of pressure and that sort of thing right so i've liked a lot of it what we've seen he has a bullet of a shot when he uses it um, obviously too, he's, he's built like a tank. And so when he does get engaged physically, um, he, he, he's a really tough can, man. Yeah. Really yeah. hard to move off the puck for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot to like there. Um, I do also uh, want to mention too, that the reputation he does come in with, uh, and I wrote a story about it three weeks ago, uh, mm-hmm. the reputation he comes in with is a guy that is good when he wants to be, mm-hmm. uh, um, obviously has obvious NHL talent, but sure. hasn't always used it. And so it does sound like that he is very motivated here that he kind of knows that he's at 2017 first round pick 2017 pick. That was the point of it, that he's at the end of his angel rope here. And he think he knows it. That's, 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 that's what I understand. That's what I've heard. And so if he does have that attitude, then yeah, then maybe indeed uh, he's going to work out. Uh, but Again, let's just want to throw in a little bit of caution with it. And once again, it is so interesting. There's something you pointed out, uh, Keegan, uh, that Micra has accumulated so many of these 2017-18 picks, right? So many of them that are just sort of on their last NHL, like not very last, but they're nearing the, the mm-hmm. end of their, their NHL rope. Like if they don't make it, um, then they're headed to another league maybe. And yeah. guys like... Um, Kalen Addison, 2018 pick, uh, Jackson Nico, who we're going to talk about, 2017 pick, mm-hmm. and Phillips Zadina, 2018 pick, one. right? Yeah. So, and a couple others that I, so many of them that I'm actually, uh, actually, even Luke Cunning, I think, right? Was Ty Emerson as well. I think Ty, Ty Emerson's a great one. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent call, call there. Yeah. Uh, so I think that is a really interesting, uh, you know, part of 
the strategy that of of what of of, of how Mike is trying to build a, a competitive team. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, though, so so clean though though had a had a very good week uh he's not looking out of place on the sharks top line so uh so credit to him so yeah i'm very excited to see uh what he comes with next year but actually that's the thing i'm looking at most though does he is he taking his kind of uh his last not i'm not saying his very last angel shot but his True. one Still of his last angel true. shots very seriously mm -hmm. uh by getting a little lighter, getting a little quicker out there because a lot of people talk about how he can skate and how, how quick he, I don't actually see quite as much quickness as I, as I want uh, out of him. And I, that might be a part of it. Why? Um, and he loses a little bit. He's not going to lose that size, that frame, that you know, tank, like whatever. So mm -hmm. he won't lose anything. He'll only gain, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if he can, uh, get a little, uh, a little, uh, lighter out there. Yeah. It, I just, it, it, it blows my mind. The 23, 24 year olds that it's just all in a year that he's just like shoved on this team um, pretty much for free. Like, I mean, you get yeah. Dina, you get, uh, you get Constant, you get Emerson, you get Addison. Like, what do we send like a fifth round pick all, all together for all those dudes? Yeah. And, and uh, seventh and seven. round pick, right. Yeah. With Shimmick. Um, yeah. Addison was just the fifth Raska. Yeah. No, not a lot. Um, not a lot. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not like they oh, are even again. Henry Thrun too. Actually, is is yeah. in, in, right? Yeah. So he's a twenty eighteen, right? 18, or was he was he nineteen? Oh, oh he's, he's eighteen. Nineteen. He, was no, he... no, no, we just talked about this. He's nineteen because we were talking about. Oh the, yeah, uh, we were. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just missed. Right. Yeah. 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 But... <laughs> um, so he's twenty nineteen, but yeah, same age range. Um, I don't know. It again. I, I think I, I do like the way that Costin plays and the way that Zetterlin plays. I think both those guys are are have a, a role in this because they can play hard and they can be physical and uh they're kind of the the opposite of guys like LeBanc and Hoffman and, and those guys in mm -hmm. terms of they can be physical on the ice and I think that's what he's trying to get is if you're gonna lose you need to at least play hard <laughs> and yeah. I'm hoping that that's what happens next year there's a kind of a fit of lines too right because people mm -hmm. like oftentimes are like well why don't you put like your just your best players together like Eklund with Granlin and Barlow sure. First of all, that that line will be the smallest first line uh, in, in the NHL. NHL. I would guess. I'm not, I don't even know, but like <laughs> I, I would guess, right? And I mean, that's fine if, if 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 they're small, but no one is small in sort of the 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 we'll talk about a guy like a Ryan Leonard, like a bullish small. Like you, you, so you need you need to mix styles, right? And so that's yeah. why that's why a, a, a costing uh, could make sense with actually I, I mentioned this too that uh, uh, uh yesterday's game um or no the game two days ago um with Eklin and Granlin and why mm. maybe they kind of work apart well because they they are the sharks best you know now hurdle is gone uh they're the best sort of puck protectors on the sharks and which is kind of counterintuitive because they're so small but they're crafty they're quick on their feet right so that makes them very good puck protectors if you put them all together or you put them Granlin and Eklund together then who on your second line now is going to protect the puck down low who has got the moves and the craftiness down low right mm -hmm. uh, and so that Again, so that just speaks to like the importance of, of matching styles, right? And mixing yeah, and matching course. styles. It's not just about putting your most skilled players together. We also had the return of our, I guess, our number one goaltender, Mackenzie Blackwood, because we have <laughs> traded Kapokakadin. So there is no more debate about a number one goaltender at the, at the current moment with Vanacek injured. Mm -hmm. Um how did uh, how did you like Blackwood this week? Um, it was terrific, right? Terrific. Uh, Minnesota, um, they had no right to be in that game. They were in it because Mackenzie Blackwood. Obviously, they won the St. Louis game really just mm -hmm. because of Mackenzie Blackwood because St. Louis came out and 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 killed them. Uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of promise. Again, you got to be, be be cautious about it. You know, everyone's back on a Mackenzie Blackwood uh, um, uh, a bandwagon, which he when he's on, he's he's a great goalie, but goaltending so fickle. And so hopefully you can keep keep sustain it. I think it's going to be a uh, at least an intriguing duel uh, with him and uh, Vanacek next year. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I am curious to see how, how that works out. And uh, I do hear internally that they really do like Blackwood that uh, I think I mentioned this last podcast, the talent, they, they, they think that he has top 10, uh, in the league talent. And so again, he's another guy, uh, well, he's, uh, same along the same lines of these 2017, 18 picks though. McKenzie is an earlier pick, but, uh, just a guy with talent and see if he can put it, put it together here. And one thing that was interesting, uh, I wrote an article about this and just, it was just, uh, looking things up, um, 
that Blockwood is in line to have the second best goal saved uh, above expected season of any Sharks goalie since of, of getting the Bokhoff in 2009, 10. That's that's pretty pretty amazing. It does kind of speak to uh, both Martin Jones and Antti Niemi, even at their best, right? For the most part, we're kind of considered like more like I don't know uh, caretakers or whatnot. That they were good, yeah. but like they weren't yeah. necessarily stealing you games. Like they call those in the uh, in like the NFL or in college football, like uh, your game manager. Oh, quarterback. sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. like they're there. They're gonna not lose you a game, but that's what that's what. Martin Jones and sometimes they'll win you a game too, right? So yeah, let's not forget that Martin did that and Auntie did that too at times. But mm -hmm. uh, that they were they weren't supposed to lose you a lot of games either, in which they they, they didn't they didn't do for the most part. And mm -hmm. so anyway, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can win a Stanley Cup with that and all that kind of stuff, right? But True. I just thought that was interesting that um, that uh, that Blackwood has, is is on the way, and there's still uh, uh, seven games to go in the season, so his stats may may take an ugly turn. But right now, though, I think his goal save above expected um, all situations is an evolving hockey stat. By the way, is uh, is a plus ten, which uh, puts him in like the like I think like twentieth in the league out of like fifty sixty goalies, which is not 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 that bad. Not bad. Yeah, that's, and his that's overall save ball. percentage is like right at 900. So if it, it'll be a miracle if he can just keep it at 900. Not bad for this team, yeah. That that'll be fantastic, honestly. Like uh, unexpected season, I think, from Mackenzie Blackwood, and I'm happy that um, going forward, at least that he's still pretty young. He's 27, and yeah. goalies tend to to come on a little later. And yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll and let's see. let's give uh, Mike credit for this one because we're going to spend a whole podcast dissecting all of Mike's moves and criticizing some of them with Pierre and Jimmy. Um, that <laughs> Mackenzie Blackwood, um, I six six round pick a lot. There were questions about it at the time, and then they signed the contract immediately after it, so they kind of showed like. Uh, their faith in, in McKenzie and he has repaid it this year and with hope uh, of more. It's a interesting gamble. It, we, yeah. We almost touched on it. They, they did mention that you got to build from the net out, but we never really like got into uh, to spoil it a little, got into McKenzie's play this year, um, but definitely a bright spot for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, we won let's, a game. Let's, 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 let's not talk about the sharks. Yeah. Stop talking about the Sharks. They they won a game. Let's close our eyes to the rest of it. Yeah, let's, some, let's let's talk about the the, the kids. We got prospects to talk about. Yeah, that's that's exciting. what people love. Hope, hope, hope for the future. Uh, I went to um, the uh, BC versus Michigan Tech game, um, which was a lot of fun. This was a, uh, a regional, regional one of the regionals, right? Yeah, the two regionals. Yeah, the um, uh, I guess it's not the is it the quarterfinals? I guess it would be the yeah, quarterfinals, I suppose, uh, for the the NCAA tournament. And uh, Will Smith had a, I think he had one assist that game. He was okay. Um, BC blew uh, Michigan Tech out of the water by the end of the game, um, which they were expected to do. I thought he did fine. These two games from Will Smith, and, and uh, to spoil it, BC is going to the Frozen Four, so woohoo. It's yep. going to be great. Um but uh, it weren't the best from Will Smith, so uh, no, they were not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Shang, you watched? Did you watch the? Uh, you watched? I the watched both game? games. Oh, you did um, both games. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I I was pretty underwhelmed based on those games. Mm -hmm. But I will say though that his intelligence is clear. That's one thing that people say say about Will that yeah. it's it's subtle and you can't you can't you don't always see it in the plays that actually you know transpire in the ice but he's a very very smart player like uh watching that that bc power play it's like the equivalent of the of an oilers power play kind of right like for that <laughs> level that they're basically the yeah. oilers uh on the on that power play and he's the he's the brains behind that power play too uh he's sort of you know they use him on the point and he mm -hmm. more than anybody uh out there in my opinion uh just just even the in these two games where he I think posted average to below average results or effort, right? Or game is average to below average overall, games yeah. for him, right? That like he clearly was sort of the uh, to me like the 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 brains of the power play too. And yeah. so anyway, so such so, such so, a so, such a smart player. Uh, obviously, yeah, a couple of bad games, it happens, right? And so no, I'm not worried about him per se. But mm -hmm. yeah, in terms of the long term projection, yeah, he definitely is a type of guy that there's gonna. There's going to be a, a, a sort of a process probably where a lot of, um, uh, let me say. Up and down, I guess. 
yeah, a, a, a lot of the the recklessness in his game, right? Yeah. Will, will will need to change, yeah. and I think it will. And I think the Sharks are betting that it will. But you do see the talent, and you do see the intelligence, and so not worried about it. Yeah. I think, and obviously the two games before that, he had five points and four points. So like, right, right, right. <laughs> we're we're uh, complaining about championship. Yeah. Yeah. The hockey's championship against BU with the biggest game of the year up to that point, basically um, for him. Um, and he put up five points, you know, four goals and assists. So yeah, up and down. I think the, the biggest thing with Will Smith that to me that sticks out when he's having a bad game uh, or a series of bad games, he sticks to the same, um, like hope passes that he he's tried in other games and he just keeps throwing the puck into places that he thinks people are going to be at. And oftentimes they're not, and he just keeps doing it like, and, and it's kind of annoying to watch, but he just will throw the puck in the center of the ice or throw it to Gabe Perot, even though Perot's covered and he just keeps on, he gets in this mode where he can't switch up his play to be more individualistic or keep the puck longer to make a play. He'll just start throwing pucks. And I think that kind of um, like uh Patience and um, maturity is going to be something that that's really the differentiator between like a good hockey player and like an actual first line center in the NHL. Yeah, so yeah. That's my big thing with him is he he just kind of gets in this mode that he's got to throw the puck immediately to somebody instead of trying to um, be a little bit more um, deferential in his puck. Yeah, play. I mean, I, he he sees stuff that that other people aren't seeing, and I think sometimes that's... he sees stuff that. Yeah, sometimes his teammates aren't seeing, and he he, yeah. kind of... <laughs> he just throws but... it, and, and he's like, "Oh, why aren't you there?" <laughs> he he really is. He's I think in terms of a specific skill, he's probably the best passer the Sharks have had since since like Joe Thornton. Like he's, he's maybe his Eric Carlson terrific. type too, right? Or, that, yeah, that, yeah, I guess yeah, so. that. No, I'm just I'm saying that that's I think that's that's what uh, uh, Carlson is. would do sometimes too. Just see stuff that. Uh, mm-hmm. He was ahead of his teammates in in in, in some way sometimes, and Agreed. so I can I can see that like with uh, with uh, with Will. Yeah, I guess I meant forward, but same same thing that you're mentioning. Like uh, Carlson has that vision that nobody else on the ice has, and I really do say the same thing. I think that translates too. Yeah, because that's what I keep I do keep hearing, and it's hard to say oh, if a guy is super smart in NCAA if it's going to translate to NHL much faster. Mm-hmm. But I think though that's that is the belief that that will translate that kind of. Uh, a uh, higher level, if not, if not quite Joe Thornton, Eric Carlson, because those are some okay. enormous names that we're mentioning there. But if not quite there, that still be mm-hmm. very, very high level for the NHL. And that's what will is going to survive on in the NHL. And so yeah. if, if I think that's the assumption that that's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Joe had the, the frame and the the puck protection ability to, to blend that amazing vision and create sure. a superstar forward. And that's, I think that's the, the downside with Smith is like the, he, you know, he's, Decent size, six foot or so. Um, decent. Yeah, speed. skating is okay, but yeah, again, Carlson was uh, in An his elite prime skater. Too. Sure, so you, sure, you that's get, fair. You're missing that, like uh, when he's when he's not on, you're missing that kind of thing to fall back on. I guess this is a good way to put it. But I, I still still love Will Smith, and we're gonna talk wink wink in the in the future with a guest about Will Smith. So yes, yes. I would still make that trade that we talked about last week, though. <laughs> would you? Okay. Was <laughs> was Will Will Smith and the. The the two or three pick uh, uh, for uh, um, you know, for Mac and Celebrini, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, let's not forget the Sharks do have the worst record. Uh, double, I will remind you of, of this a lot yeah. as the as the lottery comes up that the Sharks can't drop any further than three. So yeah, um, basically take a take a quarter and flip it twice, and if you get heads both times. Uh, then the Sharks pick Macklin Celebrini. So that's like, that's the way it's like 25%. Like it's not a high percentage, right? And um, that's what we're doing here. Let's say wait it, here though, because uh, you watched a little bit of Lashunov. Let's be real here. Sharks obviously can lose the lottery. So we need to talk about more than uh, yeah. Celebrini. And so yeah. would you trade a chance at, at Lashunov and Will Smith for uh, Macklin Celebrini. Talk about the Lashuna. Ah, that's the, such a, yeah. such a, <laughs> it's, it, I think it's, 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 a uh, it's an argument though, right? This is, it's not cut and dry, right? Like I mm-hmm. think, I think Macklin's pretty special and we talked about him being a franchise center and yeah. in the winning franchise center mode, the Jonathan Taves mode. And so mm-hmm. that to me is worth, I don't know, let's say Will Smith, Clayton Keller, Lashuna, who, who knows who, who he is, but mm-hmm. to me it is. Yeah. So anyway, no, you're right. I, I think, um, 
Ah, it's really tough. You do have to think about it for a long time. I'm going to say it's, I'm going to not make the decision until the, till the draft and then we'll see. Okay. Um, I like Lipshunov. I watched him yeah, versus, yeah, nice. versus Michigan. Um, I think at the end of the day, Lipshunov is going to be in my top three or four. I think he's I think still I in your top defenseman. He was your top defenseman. I he right in your top 16 a couple weeks ago. Listen to that podcast guys. Keegan's top 16. 20, yes. draft still my top three. defenseman. I think, okay. um, I, I just really like his game. You can see it in everything that he uh, he does offensively that um, he gets it and he um, knows how to direct the puck from the point to to um, affect play, keep the puck in the zone. Uh, What's his it, best trait to you? Um, I think it's the the um, this is going to sound strange, but his ability to pinch is like really, really yeah. good. Like it, it's um, it can be risky at times, especially mm-hmm. in college hockey when guys aren't. Um, always like covering for you your forwards exactly in the nhl now like defensemen pinch all the time and they pinch right. like very and forwards aggressively know. And yeah. forwards, and forwards know. don't don't cover they get yeah. benched so exactly but it's not like the old days even like 10 15 years ago where like pinching was for the specific defenders sure um, sure Levchinov's course, the yeah, kind yeah. of guy that has the size um the the handling ability the offensive talent that when he pinches he really is a, like a, effective down there he's like mm-hmm. a like a brent burns or petrangelo is a good one mm-hmm. too that i've seen comps for and i think that's a good one too mm-hmm. uh petrangelo even back when he was coming up didn't do it that much and now he's kind of like over the past couple of years turned into that but mm-hmm. i think those are good comps big right-handed defensemen with um good good feet good motor good physicality and um offensive skills that I, he's still my top guy. I, I think I could see him in a first pairing role okay. uh, because of all of the above. And his his game matches a future NHL defense blue line than, or a blue line rather than like a past one. Um, or, oh, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. I got or you. like even he's not so crazy on the ice that like, you know, he's going to flame out like a, a lot of other smaller um, offensive uh, guys. So. He's still my number one. I, I like him a lot. I'm going to put him in top three or four at the end of the year, I, I, okay. I think. Okay. Um, I think Demidov's going to end up at two. but mm-hmm. that's uh, And he's two right now, but he's, I think he's going to stick there. Okay. Maybe some movement around there. but You had Lipshunov five, I think? I think I had Lipshunov five. I think he's yeah. going to move up okay. at the end of the day. Okay. Lidstrom just came back from injury. Mm-hmm. He was four. Mm-hmm. Um, he, uh, I don't know. He, um, <laughs> he, I love him, but he, he, um, he's just come back from a long, long injury Okay. and back problems always kind of scare, mm. um, NHL teams. So yeah, we'll see if he, he moves down on my list and I think the potential's there, but uh, I think, um, you never want somebody to have an injury this early. That's, that's affecting mm. their play. So yeah. Well, the type that lingers, right. Or yeah. yeah. I think Gabe Velarde actually had an injury in his draft. He did. That's set. why he dropped. Yeah. He, yeah. uh, yeah, he 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 wouldn't. I I know that the yeah the Kings had no plan for him being there at I think what eleven right. So yeah, so yeah, and he's you know yeah. turned into a great pick and and people saw the skill then too. I just wonder if something similar is going to happen to. Lidl. But you know we're talking about uh, Gabe Velarde, um, you know in his twenties right. So we'll talk five years if it's still looking at you know. Long I think time. that's 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 that's. Uh, that's that's what teams do do think about, right? Yeah, like the long game. Okay, yeah, this guy might be good for five years, but mm-hmm. ten years. <laughs> it's starting to look at it, yeah, because right. yeah. even Pierre mentioned it that this draft is not as deep as last year, and the top five isn't guys that are going to be on your team in the next two or three years. It's just like sure, it, sure. It, like some of them at least are not going to be there. They're going to oh, yeah, except for Celebrini, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, except for Celebrini. It's going to take four or five years, like most drafts do, other than last year, which it was like. Right. The top five, six, seven were just fantastic. Um, barely ever happens. So, anyway, super excited for the Frozen Four. Um, gonna be exciting to watch. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about another first round pick. Then uh, the Sharks' twenty twenty two first round pick, Philip uh, Beestead, is uh, about to make his uh, North American professional debut with the San Jose Barracuda. To- uh, Sharks just uh, brought him over. He met with uh, the Barracuda in, on Monday in San Diego. Um, the Barracuda play uh, today uh, yep. in San Diego. Yeah, they, they play today, uh, Wednesday. And so uh, I think that there's a pretty good chance we'll see uh, Beast at tonight. Well, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, Thursday, 
Uh, they also play on Thursday at Barracuda. They also play on Saturday. And so I would expect that we see Beast Dead there. I also think this is not a prospect thing, but I've been meaning to mention that. Uh, I think that we'll see Akeem Alou, too, if not uh, this road trip, but soon. Just want to throw that Ooh. in there. I hadn't put that out there yet. So, um, But um, anyway, though, back to, to Beast Dead. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting to see uh, sort of uh, what the Sharks have gotten. And obviously, this season has been a little bit of a plateau season with them after a, really a breakthrough year last last year shl rookie of the year last year uh tied for the team lead on sweden um mm -hmm. for in points uh at the world juniors the 2023 world juniors but um yeah so we'll see we'll see we'll see uh, what they've got but in terms of just the type of player that he is um you had some some thoughts about that yeah if you haven't watched beast up before he's a uh mobile uh lanky center um at that that um has some flashes of offensive talent and can carry the puck across the, the blue line um, and can play 200 foot uh, game. And the bowl that you're looking for is like a third line center that has the size, the speed and the skill um, to really round out a line, and keep your, at a, your team at a slight advantage on the third line. That's what you really want beast at to be. Yeah. A guy so. that can pop in 30, 40 points, maybe right. Exactly. Like there's some talk that he, could reach a ceiling of if he's on your second line, uh, you're not complaining. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, more likely, I think third line I think that is was the, the uh, more realistic ceiling. So yeah. after last year, you were really hoping that he'd take another leap, and then then you were looking at right, like, second like a, line. a comfortable second line guy. Yeah, yeah. But, this this year, my my biggest complaint with Beastad, it's something that I'm really hoping that the smaller ice surface and uh, maybe some coaching really instills into him is his physicality and mm -hmm. his um he he typically tends to avoid open ice contact um he's decent I, on the boards mm -hmm. can i can i fix uh or, or mention too that i think people always think physicality it's just like hitting people and it's not sure like people like mm -hmm. like it's it's not like we'll talk about jack sneak in a second like yeah. it's about a lot more than than just like uh, a big hitting. hit here and there yeah yeah and i think the um yeah you don't I, you don't have to like you know lay somebody out every shift but i think he does he, he typically will reach for the puck instead of trying to actually lay the body or or yeah, yeah. or um at least get in somebody's way uh mm -hmm. a lot more and he has the skill or the size and the speed to really if he wanted to actually lay the body or at least um use his frame to his advantage but he doesn't he he, he he's very um i'll call it uh swedish in that regard <laughs> he's very used to the open ice and very mm -hmm. used to not being able to hit anybody that i wonder when he gets to the ahl if he's going to be forced to be a little bit more physical um and i'm hoping for it because i think he has the ability to to really do it and at his size and he's going to need a couple more years to really if you try to to walk into the nhl i think you mentioned this before uh off the air it wouldn't work just because he's yeah he's not there physically at all um yeah so I that's think, what I want uh, to see from him. You I mentioned think. the coaching too, and the Sharks have the right person in the mm -hmm. Mike Ricci to develop him. Mike Ricci was the model third line center in his day. Yep. And uh, Mike helped develop Barkley Goodrow recently, one of the premier uh, checking forwards of, of the last uh, decade or so at, you know, at the, at the top of his game. And yeah. also too, uh, Jackson Nika, that's what they're trying to do with Jackson Nika too. And so it's interesting that uh, you have a guy with that kind of frame and that skating in, in BC. And that's mm -hmm. why you draft a guy that high, even if he's not that productive or he was lower yeah. on draft list because you're looking ahead three, four years from now, what can this guy be? Right. Yeah. And so what can this guy be? Well, uh, if, uh, if he, listens to what mike is telling him uh it should be a pretty good player yeah yeah, yeah. and his skating has come a long way too in his draft year right. he had he had um in a straight line he had very good uh top end speed and you could see it uh, but his acceleration was a little bit lacking and he um he obviously has added more muscle since his draft year and it's kind of it's shown he's he's got a lot more acceleration his first couple steps are a lot improved um his offensive game hasn't taken off like you really really hoped it would i think um it's tough to say exactly why he's he's a decent playmaker but there's no real standout uh, shooting or mm -hmm. passing or, or really a standout offensive skill that that separates him other than he could carry the puck in the zone pretty well so it's tough um he's gonna need a few more years for at sure. this moment where are you at uh with uh connor geeky the 11th pick for beastead lun and havlid last last year looked like a clear tilting clear winner 
But I think it's closer year, just because closer, Geeky yeah. Geeky has him. Uh, he's shown up. I mean, he's playing in a junior league, so it's like he's a huge guy in a junior league. But right. he, uh, when I've watched him, he's he's looked a lot more improved as mm -hmm. a player. Um, and he did in his draft year. I'd still probably take uh, Beast at uh, Lund and Havlet than okay. just Geeky alone. But there are other guys that were drafted after eleven. Well, that, uh, we can't. That's they, they didn't trust didn't draft him. So I know they didn't get get Yuri Kulik or <laughs> yeah or um, JD was late. Or Lane Brad, Hudson in there. Brad in their Lambert. Lambert or... yeah. So yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't. I you, you keep, that's too much hindsight. I, I would. I would do those. Literally, three. the guys that they that. Only because Lund has had a better year this year. Havlid still is, um, still has NHL potential, and and Bistad is still is obviously good. It is interesting though that apparently uh, Havlid, uh, you know, uh, Bistad and Havlid play together on Linchaping. Um, yeah, that I think there's I think Havlid there's an was issue. left at home. So yeah, I think there's an issue with the the CBA about that though. I think it's something has to do with the him being a second round pick. He can only play in the NHL up, up mm. until a certain age or something like that. It's oh, very, I should know that. Oh, that's good. That's a good. That's a good point. I think, actually think you're right about that. Yeah. So. There's a. It's a complicated thing, and, it, yeah. and it's it's just started. Like I think in the last two or three years. Yeah, yeah. There is a new agreement. That I remember mm. actually uh, learning about that a couple of years ago. So yeah, I think he. So. I think okay. he can only play in the Fair. NHL uh, up until a certain time. Okay. I don't remember what age. Yeah, like 24, I think maybe. Yeah, something like that. Which is kind of. It means that, like, obviously, that's why they picked Beast at it you know, 28 or whatever, or 27 is because they, they knew that bit. And like, they, if you, he, he was projected more as like an early second round pick. Mm -hmm. Um, but they were like, we got to swing for him here. I think maybe not for the specific reason, but maybe who knows, but it's a, it's a plus now. I think, yeah, no, I, I, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense that with, with a uh, half lit. So it might be a ways till we see him. Then he has to be ready when he comes. So basically, um, yeah. Something like that. Anyway, uh, our last topic of the day before we get to our Pierre interview, Pierre and Jimmy, um, mm -hmm. the Jack Stud Nika recall. You wrote a whole article on this today. Actually. I wrote two articles about it. Two articles. <laughs> They're pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> on San Jose um, Hockey Now. <laughs> I, I, I do actually find it very interesting. Uh, well, first, uh, I touched on why the obvious question is, why did you call up uh daniel gushin why did you call up shakira mukumadun right and i i outlined that in the story uh mukumadun is dealing with some sort of injury i'm not precisely sure. sure what and for how how long but uh, he got hurt i believe over the weekend uh, when they were in calgary and mm -hmm. he left uh sunday's game uh, midway and so depending on if you look at the injury like oh he's out for even if he's out for a week i mean there's not much time left in the season there's two weeks left in the season so like well if he's not going to be uh, uh we don't uh, we maybe we don't save a regular recall for him, and uh, people forget too that the, you have the emergency recall option too, and so that can still happen for both uh, Mukmadulin and Gushin. But anyway, in regards with Gushin and not calling him up, um, he has been on a tear recently, of course. I think he's on a six game point scoring streak. Mm -hmm. But what I understand, this isn't just talking with the Sharks, and I talked with other sources, and just to make sure that this wasn't just sort of like uh sharks uh sort of uh feeding me a line so to speak right <laughs> um that gushin um still isn't seen as he was out uh for over a month with the upper body injury mm -hmm. and when he came back first five games or so just had an assist and you know wasn't maybe quite himself there the timing yep. and sharpness wasn't quite there 100%. and even though he's been scoring recently it's still not quite at the level where you want to bring him up to the nhl Mm -hmm. Of course, Neil Gushin is so skilled that um, he doesn't have to be at his best to produce a lot in AHL. But if you want to put him in, NH in the NHL, then you want him at something like his best, right? You want to give him his best chance. You don't want to force him when maybe he's still getting back his timing a little bit and all that kind of stuff, right? And so I think that has a little bit more to do with it than any sort of uh, like Gushin's been passed over or 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 whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um I I actually thought at first that 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 Daniel might be quite like would would wonder why he wasn't called up, but I think that that that's comfortably more around the reason of it that it's uh you know closer to kind of protecting him. Um and True. so and also too one one thing I, I I I realized too as I was writing my articles yesterday is that Sanika he is uh he he's going to be RFA and starts to make a decision on it. Basically, 100%, right? Yep. And whereas with uh, Daniil, Daniil has another year in his ELC, uh, Mukmadul and two, right? They both had their taste. Mm -hmm. 
both of them had to come, you know, they're, they're not going to, uh, um, in this last little stretch in NHL, like what are they, they are amazing in it or they're not right. It doesn't really change the Sharks decision on them or whatnot too much. Right. Like the Sharks, mm-hmm. they're signed for another year. You know, those guys, they need, they need, they, they need to, they need to be ready to show their a game during training camp next year to take a job. If they don't take a job next year, then it's going to be, Oh, ooh, they're in their last year, of their ELC. Then there's some question marks about uh, their trajectory as, as players. But uh, these last few games for them, you know, we they 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 have a taste. They know they know what they need to do during the summer. They know what the angel is like, right? Whereas yep. Stanika, right? Oh, so Stanika, um, when the Sharks sent Stanika down, they sent him down with a clear mandate of you got to change your game. You got to take. Uh, you got to change your game from what you were brought up uh, as as a playmaking center, and you have to remodel, refashion yourself into a defensive center like a Nico Sturm kind of type, right? So. Apparently he's he's done that he's gone there and and done that and so I'm very curious to see what the results are and if mm-hmm. he has indeed done that and it's actually worked then the sharks are gonna I think it's gonna be a no brainer for the sharks to sign him right if he, there's still some rough spots or they're not seeing it then of course then it, that's gonna be a different question but uh, he says that he's gone down there and done it. he's made those changes and so I think this is also gonna be uh, interesting sort of. Um, I don't want to say litmus test because it's just one player, but Sharks development, I, I, I feel, has been unfairly maligned over the years. I don't think they've had a lot to work with. And yeah, so when I look at sort of their – people say, well, where are their successes over the last uh, decade or so, right? Mm-hmm. And I think people forget um, Barkley Goudreau, who I already mentioned, and Barkley Goudreau was a undrafted free agent – that they re- they remodeled his game. He was a big big scorer and ended up in in the OHL. And they turned him into, like I said, mm-hmm. uh, who closed out both Tampa Bay Lightning Stanley Cups. The very last shift, who was out there to help close out those games, the clinching games, Barkley Goudreau. Um, so I I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that he is one of the premier checking line forwards in in the league. Uh, yep. A couple of years ago, I know this game may have fallen off a little bit with the Rangers after his big contract. That's neither here nor there, though. But at his best, right? Another big development success for the Sharks. And these are guys that are like little, like like not nothing, but pretty much nothing as NHL players when they pick them up too, or very, you know, very very lowly regarded. That they developed into real, not just not just guys who just played games, but guys who are legitimate contributors to Stanley cup or to winning teams. So the other guy was going to mention, I mentioned before, Jake Middleton, uh, yeah. Jake Middleton was a last pick of, of, uh, of his draft by the Kings. The Kings didn't sign him. Uh, Middleton was on the sharks for a number of years with the Barracuda, not with the sharks, with the Barracuda for a number of years. It looked like that was going to be his career, AHL journeyman, uh, but he kept working. They kept working with him. Right. And now he is a, Top four defenseman Brock Faber's Parker on a decent team with the Wild. Top four defenseman last year for a playoff team for the Wild, and so those are I think two clear development wins of guys that really needed a lot of development, right? And so that shows shows to me that you have a good uh, uh, you were developing players back then, um, mostly Brian Marchman and Mike Ricci uh, back then. Now they've added a bunch of people to it: uh, Patrick Marlowe, mm-hmm. Tommy Wingles. Lucas Biza, Todd Marchant, so a lot of the, Ryan Miller. They've got a lot of people to to that group. Um, so I'm curious with Stanika to see if this can be another win for Sharks development. I think another thought I had too, and I didn't write this, is that uh, Stanika has sort of the the tools to kind of change his game. Like uh, he is long, he's big, uh, he skates well, right? So sure. he's a guy that has the tools to be a good defensive center. I think that's the difference between like someone may point out like, Oh, well I got a Kalen Addison, right? A year younger. That guy is not any different than, than, than he was with the, uh, when the Sharks acquired him. Well, Kalen has obvious limitations in his game, right? He's not the most dynamic. He's small. Obviously he's not the most dynamic uh, players in terms of his skating, right? That sort of thing. Yeah. Right. So Kalen his physical frame is, is underdeveloped. As yeah. Well. Yeah. Like Kalen's like, like you can't refashion Kalen into a defensive stopper. He mm-hmm. would love it. The sharks would love it. Right. <laughs> and that would guarantee his career. Like you can't refashion him into, I don't think you can at least into like even a Jared Spurgeon, a uh, sure. smaller type player, but who has other physical traits that make him, 
uh, into the player that he is, a, a top defenseman that he was uh, at his best, right? And I don't think Kalen has that. So I don't know how much he can change in Kalen's game. Um, but with a Jack Sonica, though, I think there are tools there that you can mm -hmm. uh, you can re change it and uh, you can you can remold them into a new player. And so anyway, I'm very interested to see. Again, he's saying the right things uh, after the Sharks call him up. Uh, David Quinn says he's going to give him a lot of penalty killing time. And so that's a, another part of the equation for being a bottom six center. He also uh, he has, like I mentioned, a perfect model in the locker room of a player that was a big scorer in college in Nico Sturm that changed his game into being a Stanley Cup winning fourth line center in Nico Sturm. And so anyway, uh, I'm curious. We saw, to see. A, uh, yeah. we saw a real change with Bordelow's game as well after a, yep. a little bit of more time in the in the Barracuda. So I think you're right. I think. Uh, that's what they're hoping for. And I, and I like the point about they have to make a decision on him because it, it really is him and Bordalo too. Both of them are, yeah. are RFAs. They really have to make Well, Bordalo's I mean, not RFA. He's a, what, a 10-2 10 10. player? 10.2, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which just, it, it just means that basically he can't be offer sheeted, but yeah. the Sharks have to decide whether or not they're going to qualify him. That's what and I mean. Not to they say will. that he was a threat to not be qualified even without this, but yeah. and not to say that Bordalo has arrived arrived. I like a lot about Bordalo's game, but of course. there's still consistency. I talk about costing, you know, let's not uh yeah. let's not like pencil them into the line lineup like uh next even next year or True. for for a future sharks team. But uh obviously the Bordalo has shown a leap in his game here in the last little bit, and that's what we're looking for for Stanika. Like you're not saying that obviously if he plays well, okay, you found your third line center for the next five years, but you want to see a, a real hope for that, and then then you resign him and see if he can develop even more next year. So yeah. and if um back to Gushin, I think um I the first couple of games he came back, he wasn't very good at all, in my opinion. But he and that's me being a Gushin lover. I, he just hadn't hadn't adjusted back from his injury. Sure. He clearly stepped it up past couple of games, but um, I think the uh, the real thing is like they have so many skilled uh, softer wingers, and mm -hmm. right now, and there's nobody that um, Gushin is really replacing in a lineup right now. And I think after this year, when they lose guys like LeBanc, Hoffman, maybe Varabanov, who knows, um, that there will be possibly space for somebody like Agustin to step sure. in. Sure. Yeah, and even Zadina, right? We don't know if they're going to bring him back. So that's another guy, right? And then maybe Bordalo. Yeah, maybe Bordalo and Gushin can't step in and fill those shoes. So, uh, but yeah, that's another part of it, too. That Sharks really needed a center because uh, they yeah. were using Luke Cunning and William Eklund there for uh, far too long. <laughs> so it's all a combination of him coming back from injury, not having the strongest couple of games mm -hmm. to, to come back. Now he he's looking more like Gushin, but, um, and then, yeah, just the, what they needed on the lineup for the Sharks. So maybe he still gets a game or two in. I hope he does. Yeah. Emerging recalls. Yeah. I, I, I think I mentioned this last week and I, I all talked with a lot of mm -hmm. HL people like, yeah, they're, they're they're sort of uh, uh, unconcerned about the regular recalls. They just they just manipulate the emergency the emergency <laughs> recalls. Have you know, especially for Mook Medulla, the Sharks have seven healthy defensemen. I think you can tell a couple of those guys to take a night off. I actually the forwards I think will be a different different story because you have a uh, uh, Mike Hoffman, you have a Kevin LeBeck literally fighting for their NHL lives, like literally. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they might be a little more like, eh, I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> if I'm taking the night off. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. I, I might, I, I might need to keep playing because I, I, I might end up in a KHL next year if I, if I, if I don't, if I don't have a game or two here. But uh, I think the defense is fairly kind of secure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with their sort of, uh, their NHL futures, I think I got to look over it, but yeah, I don't want to misspeak, but I think that, that, that all of them should McDonald's be. McDonald's is probably the only Yeah, but even that, McDonald, yeah. I think is, you know, as a utility guy, like I think his like He'll sort of North American. Contract. Yeah. I, I think he should be okay. I think I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, he might be a guy who might be like, eh, I don't know about that. Yeah. I got to think about myself here, but, uh, the Jacob uh, McDonald hype train never ends. Yep, man. exactly. Um. <laughs> but anyway, so, but the forward, so yeah, like there's a little, it's a little bit harder because the Sharks have a, a, a they're a little bit healthier up front, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's how emergency recalls work, by the way. Like you can't just emergency recall because let's say Mike Hoffman has like a, like has a stubbed his toe. No, the Sharks have too many forwards. You got to get down to when it's, you know, 11 healthy forwards, then 
uh, then 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 you get to bring somebody up. So th- with the defense, they have seven healthy defensemen. So if you're telling Jan Ruda and Mark Edward Vlasic to take the night off, then you can call. Now you have five healthy defensemen. Then mm-hmm. you can call call somebody up for emergency. So yeah, uh, we'll see what happens at the end of the year. Yeah. And Gustin does still need to round back into his his dominating AHL yeah. form. So yeah. It's and fine. anyway, his big test is is training camp. Anyway, so absolutely, you know, I think he still needs to add. We talked about it with him last summer. Still needs to add a little bit more on on the weight, the quickness, right, the heaviness, right. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's his big test. Obviously, Mukhamadulin too. You know, the physical test I think Mukhamadulin is going to be the the bigger test for him because he looks like he can play this game at at, at a high level. Yeah, he's got to do it for the full season in the NHL. Hopefully, mm. next year. Yep, we'll see um that's that's pretty much it not a lot happened this week in terms of sharks news um and we are a little bit delayed on the podcast so we apologize for that we were waiting on um getting a a good time for this interview to 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 come out to give you a full episode that's uh hopefully a lot of fun for you guys to watch so i uh will we'll see you all next week maybe sooner or maybe this week because we have a couple more exciting interviews lined up so we do (laughs) we might put out quickly so yeah yep Hope you guys have a good week. Bye. Bye. All right. This week on the San Jose Hockey Now podcast, we have two very, very special guests joining us from their own podcast, The Eye Test. Love that name, guys. We have Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy. Pierre McGuire, of course, you know as one of the faces of the NHL on NBC. Also, too, he's been working with part of the NHL for a long time. He was assistant coach with the Pittsburgh Penguins, won a Stanley Cup there. Has also been with the Hartford Whalers, Ottawa Senators, you name it. Jimmy Murphy is a longtime Bruins reporter and current NHL insider for Boston Hockey Now. And so we welcome the both of them on our podcast now to talk about the Sharks. How you doing, guys? Very, very well. Uh, it's happy to uh, have you guys on. Um, also, we want to say congratulations for Pierre for um, his son um, entering the transfer portal um, and going from Colgate to Northeastern. Yeah, Ryan McGuire. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate that. Jimmy knows uh, it's been kind of a crazy uh, dynamic to get this whole thing done, but we're happy and uh, thrilled to death. Is going to go from a great school at Colgate to another great school at Northeastern. And uh, we're so excited that he's going to be mentored and coached by Jerry Keefe and Mike Levine mm-hmm. and Jason Guerrero. The coaching staff at Northeastern is phenomenal. We're really, really excited about the opportunity for Ryan. Joining and, um, Sharks prospect Cam Lund as well. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and Mike Fisher. And, and Mike, Mike Fisher. Fisher. I was just going to say there's another one. Fisher's there as well. Uh, Lund had an amazing year. He's a great goal scorer. And Fisher's up. Defenseman just finding his way right now through the port. You know, college hockey's tough for young players. Absolutely. And he's a young kid finding his way. But uh, Lund had a heck of a season offensively uh, for Northeastern this past season. Okay, so you might be wondering why we have uh, two uh, members of the East Coast hockey media here. Um, <laughs> and anyway, they had a, uh, on March 20th episode of the iTest podcast, uh, Jimmy and Pierre said some, uh, let's call them unfavorable things about the Sharks <laughs> rebuild. <laughs> Is that, is that fair? And so we're here to uh, to to discuss that. And so before we kind of discuss what you guys said, um, I wanted to actually go with um, how we perceive, Keegan and I, we perceive how the rebuild is going on here. Because, Jimmy, you did say on the podcast that, you know, you you wondered, you know, point me to the rebuild, you said. And so this is this is how, how we see it. And we'll like to see what you think of, of, of how we see it. Mm-hmm. First of all, it starts in the summer of 2022. So we must have to throw out everything that was done before because that wasn't a rebuild. That was a reset at best, but uh, that was not a rebuild. So it starts in summer of 2022 with the hiring of Mike Greer. And we agree, uh, this is to quote Pierre from the podcast, that Mike Greer inherited, what Mike Greer inherited was not good. And it was not good. Very bad. <laughs> very bad. And immediately, of course, Mike Greer trades Brent Burns. And then eventually he trades uh, Timo Meyer, Eric Carlson, Tomas Hurdle. Most of these trade returns, they bring back pretty good prospects and or picks. I think what's also underrated as part of sort of the rebuild too, the another corollary that's that's going along with the hiring of Mike Greer is that the Sharks have really built up the, their development staff uh, since the hiring of Mike. Just for example, before they hired Mike Greer, they didn't actually have a director of player development, not an official one. It was actually just... Doug Wilson Jr. Doug Wilson Jr. was also the director uh, of scouting. Can I can I interrupt for a second? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. That's grossly unfair and not true. Mm-hmm. What about Mike Ricci? What about the late Brian Marchman? 
Oh, Those no, they didn't, I didn't have a director of player development. development. They, they had, they had hey, development coaches. Look at, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I made yeah. my living in the NHL for 34 years. I'd be more, more than happy to talk to you guys. Yeah. But if you're going to tell me they didn't have a development staff, that's unfittingly wrong. Oh, I didn't say it. I said they didn't have a director of development. Well, you don't know, have a director finish. means nothing. That's just a title. Oh, like, let me, give me guys that can do the work. Let me, let me finish, though. Okay, so yeah. they had two guys before. You're definitely right. They had Mike Ricci, right? And – they what they've done though is they've built up even more from that because okay so Pierre you would know Doug Wilson uh, the father he liked to run pretty lean so he didn't have as large of a staff so one of the things that you can do now court or not that you can do now that you always do is that there is no budget there is no cap on your staff right and so they've definitely hired a lot more people with my career that's been part of part of the plan mm. and so <clears throat> just to give you an example of sort of this theme of development, right? And so they hired a, a director of player development, official one, in a Todd Marchant. And you're right, it can be just just the title. It doesn't just means you don't have a guy with that title. It doesn't mean you don't have development. So I wasn't suggesting that at all. And a lot of great players were developed by Mike Ricci and Ryan Marshman, Barkley Goudreau, just for example, is one I was just writing about recently. Great but, call. That's a great call. That's a really good call because I agree. But <clears throat> I understand your premise and your point. But I'm going to tell you, like, I know Mike Ricci really well. Mm -hmm. He was a fourth overall pick in the 1990 draft. Interviewed him. I thought he was going to be a great player. And I had the privilege of coaching the late Brian Marchman. So I wanted to make sure that everybody understood they had people that were working in development. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Just, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. And I actually want to add to that. Like, I feel like the Sharks development has been unfairly maligned uh over the last five years or so because they haven't had a lot of guys come through but i don't think that's on the development staff i mean another guy we talked about barkley goodrow another very very underrated guy that i want to give them full credit for is jake middleton uh yeah, he was absolutely. a mr irrelevant uh, of his draft mm -hmm. i think the kings picked them last of i don't remember exactly which draft the kings didn't sign him the sharks picked him up he was with the barracuda for four years just kind of tolling away didn't look like he was going to have much of an angel future and now he's a he's a top four defenseman on a pretty decent team with the minnesota wild brock faber's partner and that is because a lot of because of a brian marchman so i want to want to give them their their full yeah, credit we're on the same page. We are on the same page there. He's but... getting there in a roundabout way, but he's getting <laughs> yeah. there. He's getting there. I'm trying to try to explain the full, the kind of the full course of what's sure. going on with like what, why there is a rebuild going on. So, um, so one of the things I've noticed that since since uh, since uh, Mike Rare has come on is that they've hired many many people now with that development title. They've kept on, of course, Mike Ricci. They would have kept on. Uh, rest in peace, Brian Marshman. If uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And, but they've also added two to that, though. Besides, uh, besides Mike Ricci, uh, they've added a part, uh, Patrick Marlowe is a is a development coach. Uh, Todd Marchand, like I mentioned, uh, Luca Spiza works with the, the young younger defensemen, the uh, out of the the Shark system defensemen. Tommy Wingles, who you guys probably know well, he is uh, works with the uh, with with the forwards uh, out of the Shark system. And also too, they have Ryan Miller. They have a goaltending development guy now. And so these are all things that they didn't necessarily have before because, again, uh, not that it wasn't being done under the Doug Wilson regime, but they like to run a little leaner, I think. And I did a comparison early in the season. This is a very uh, kind of a, uh, a dirty kind of research. It's not, it's not complete, right? But I noticed that if you just look at like front, front office directories of Pacific Division teams, that they, the Sharks have six guys with the development in their title. And the Ducks had two, the Flames had four, the Oilers had zero. Again, it doesn't mean that there's no development being done in, in Edmonton. There's plenty of it being done there, as you can see with their success in the standings. Uh, the Kings have six, the Kraken have four, the Golden Knights have one. And just the overall point is that there are two major things going on with sort of the, the rebuild that, you know, in terms of is there a rebuild going on? Well, we see, again, that they are trading – uh, their big contracts or guys who will get big contracts like Timo Meyer, and they're trading them for premium picks and prospects. They obviously have really uh, beefed up the the development staff. So those are two big parts of the the rebuild. Now to touch on another point that you mentioned on on your podcast up here, uh, I'm not saying Keegan and I aren't saying that we're complete re believers of the rebuild. Of course not. You look at the, the record, they have 16 wins right now, right? Um, or 17, sorry about that. Uh, but 
Keegan and I both think that they are going in the right direction. Again, you know, dumping these contracts for premium futures. But the big thing, though, of course, and this is the part that we don't know yet uh, because it's still so early in the rebuild, is they need to execute on these picks. You know, who? what is a Will Smith going to become? He looks great so far, but who knows, right? And also, too, building up the staff is great. Like I mentioned, all the hires they made with that title development, right? But you have to hire the the right guys. And, of course, recently the Sharks had an embarrassing thing with a uh, Russian amateur scout that they hired, Igor Aronko, that they had to fire. They hired over the summer. They fired him a few months later because he wasn't doing his job. And that's that's definitely a black eye on, on all of that. And so I want to mention that, too. But... Anyway, we both think there's a definite rebuild going on. And we also don't think that you can really hold Mike Greer accountable for mistakes that Doug Wilson made before the summer of 2022. Well, I think I said that. I think I said that on our podcast is that Mike inherited a terrible situation, especially with the cap. That being said, uh, part of the premise of our show, and Jimmy, I apologize. If you want to step in, you step in at any time, was – Tell me who they're going to be better than next year in their division. Who are they going to be better than? Mm. Yeah, I guess my rebuttal to that is I don't think they plan on it. I don't think they plan on being better than anybody next year. So then you tell me who they're going to be better than in two years. Because I, you know, the, the, one, the one thing Shang said to that, that I really appreciate is premium picks and players. Yeah. Pre, well, a premium pick's only good three or four years down the road. Unless you're getting Macklin Celebrini. Yep. Yep. Because I can tell you right now, this is not a really good draft coming up. So yeah, it's not you, like last if, year. If you think if you think this is an elite draft, I got bad news for you. In three years, you're gonna say, Where did all those premium picks turn up? Because yep. you're not playing here. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we were talking about. We weren't talking about anything that Mike Greer is doing wrong. We are talking about the situation that he inherited and how is it going to be better within the next three to five years. And you guys are telling me they have all these premium picks and players. Let's see where it goes. Yeah, I would say, though, in terms of uh, when the Sharks plan to be good again, I think it's very interesting. Let's see what you guys think about this. That When they made the Eric Carlson trade, that they obviously uh, didn't retain that much, and they could have retained more and got more back for Eric, I think, right? Uh, there would have been more interest if they retained a higher amount. I think they ended up retaining something like uh, one point one point five million, right, mm-hmm. of his eleven point mm-hmm. five AAV. So not really that much of, of that of that AAV. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, though, that the money that they took back though from Pittsburgh and Montreal, Mike Hoffman, Mikhail Granlin, Jan Ruda, that all that. Uh, all their contracts, these are contracts that expire at the end of the 2024-25 season, or they expire uh, this this offseason, like Mike Hoffman's, right? And so they took on about the equal amount of AAV from those guys, but for a much shorter term. And so that opens up, in theory at least, a lot of cap space for them in a couple couple of years here. And Mike has said, he suggested, he hasn't sort of said anything concrete, but he suggested that maybe they might start making moves. Like he's talked about, you know, flipping it sooner than people expect. And he's mm. actually alluded to maybe, you know, now you have these assets, these war chests of uh, picks and prospects, right? That maybe you can make a move. And he actually cited the Joe Thornton trade that let's, again, we talk about Doug Wilson and what happened before. And let's give Doug full credit for that because that is the, defining trade of Sharks history there, uh, trading for uh, for uh, Joe Thornton. So I want to give Doug his full credit. And so Mike cited something like that, that maybe they could be in the picture for something like that in a couple of years. So in terms of next year, of course, yeah, the Sharks, I don't think there's any expectation that they're going to be any good. Now, I don't think they can be this bad. This is this this season was embarrassing, I think, uh, in, in many, many ways for many, many people. But um, I think, though, that there is a, a idea that maybe in a couple of years, because in a couple of years, I think you'll have a better idea of who Will Smith is. Like, is he a guy that you really can build a, a build around? You'll have a better idea of a William Eklund, who's shown some promise this year. But you'll see if he's like a real deal. Like, he's a guy that is he a mm-hmm. kind of an empty calorie player that's just putting up points for a bad team? Or is he a guy that can be part of a winning team? You have a Shakira Mukamadoulin, who's a very, very good de- defensive prospect, too. Again, you'll know if these guys are like real deal guys you can build around. And so mm-hmm. if they are... If you've hit on them, if you've also drafted, say, a Celebrini and he's here too, maybe you are more aggressive yeah, or, in free agency or trade in a couple of years. Or I guess, the, I don't know, if the Sharks got better last year, then everybody's kind of talking about the amazing rebuild in San Jose rather than 
the, the the sputtering you know rebuild that we're having now, right? Like, does it really just come down to getting Macklin Celebrini this year? Is that really what it, we're looking at? What do you guys think? I, well, I, I just want to reverse a bit, guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, one thing mm-hmm. just going back to what Terry and I said on that podcast a few weeks back or a month back, whenever it was. Um, the one thing I've noticed, and just from afar, you're there more. Mm-hmm. You can probably attest to this more than me, but it just seems that. Well, I'll use Montreal as an example and what they've been doing the last few years. As they've rebuilt, it seems they have put a focus on creating a positive uh, mentoring. uh, You can't say winning because they weren't really winning, but a a positive environment around the young players that they're trying to develop and and having a better culture and having uh, kind of getting everybody on the same page going forward from afar to me, it looks like the Sharks have struggled to do that so far. Now, you're saying Greer is willing to maybe go out and sign some guys with his cap space or whatever. That would be great. I think that's what he needs to do. But I think that they need to bring in some veterans to mix in with these guys and, and bring in the right veterans. Hmm. You know, I look hmm. at like like Montreal has a guy, and he was already there, but you have David Savard, right? Sure. He's a great guy to mentor some defensemen there. Who are those guys right now? that San Jose has, am I not seeing them or are they there? I mean, that's where I'm, where I'm worried about is because in my opinion, when you're rebuilding, and I, I think Pierre will agree with me on this, when you're rebuilding, you still need people around those youngsters sure. to keep yeah, them in check, to help yeah. them develop, to, to keep them positive, you know? And, and, and you know, when you're losing a lot, it, you need somebody there to kind of keep everybody together and going in the same direction. I don't see that from afar. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, um, I, I think that if we, you know, now we're kind of getting into the, the, the weeds of the details. And we've talked about this previously on the podcast, Keegan and I, uh, that I think Mike did a better job in his first offseason in terms of adding guys like Nico Sturm, Matt Benning, exactly. Luke Cunning, right? Guys that are character guys, right? Whereas I will, I will, I do actually think that this past offseason that I don't think he did as good a job of that, that he kind of over indexed on the same kind of guys like, uh, Mike Hoffman, um, Anthony Duclair, Philip Zadina, already adding them to uh, Kevin LeBanc and Alexander Barabanov, guys that are skill first guys that are not saying they're bad room guys, but they're not necessarily guys like Nico Stern that are like setting the culture, right? And I right. think he over yeah, over indexed yeah. on those guys with the hope that I think that you know you can get draft capital of the trade deadline. You know, Mike Hoffman scores 20 goals, you can trade mm-hmm. him. Uh and, and it worked for Anthony Duclair. He plays well, you can trade him for a third round pick and a decent prospect, right? But I do think that, that is part of what happened that um I would call it a mistake, maybe. That um, and you add to that too that obviously Logan Couture got hurt. That's a big room guy. Matt Benning, huge room guy. He got hurt, right? And so that kind of led to this <laughs> kind of this perfect storm of awfulness that we're seeing this year. So, so I actually ag- agree with you guys to some degree. And I think that uh, based on you know what David Quinn says, what Mike Greer has has said, that I think that they're going to reset that a little bit this off season. Maybe don't. You know, don't roll the dice on guys like uh, or roll the dice as much on guys just with the eye of maybe flipping them at the deadline. And mm-hmm. so so I, I, I agree with that in terms of the defense specifically, though, they do have a couple guys there that I think obviously Matt betting, hopefully he's healthy. And I think he's he's a great room guy. Uh, Jan Ruda, I think, is a good one, too. He's He's been good. And so I think they do have a couple guys like that, maybe not as um I think it's also why he uh, didn't didn't trade Mario, like didn't trade Ferraro, just because sure. he, he sees him as that kind of leader in locker room going forward. But you're right, there's not a lot. It's not the uh, it's not like a that there are that many veterans that are are known in the NHL as being locker room guys. So that is something maybe you could focus on uh, in the next couple off seasons for sure. Yeah, guess, definitely. Oh, go ahead, Keegan. Yeah, so I guess I don't know. It I guess the. Um, is the I guess the premise from you guys is it more what Greer is doing or did for right now during this rebuild or did you guys agree that like the Sharks really did need to trade all these contracts at some point just because of how bad they were before Mike even got there? Pierre, I'll let you take that. Well, they need, they needed to clean up a huge mm-hmm. balance sheet mess. A horse, that yeah. left, and that's why I said what I said. And Mike inherited this mess. Yep. How are you going to clean it up? That's a different story. Um, but I felt really bad when Mike went in there because, you know, if you really evaluated it without rose colored glasses, you know, that chances of turning this around real quickly weren't good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and so there've been some mistakes that have been made. You guys already alluded to it, your words, not mine. And, and a lot of it was from last summer. 
And so when that happens, when you're in a rebuild, you're, you're eating up time on the clock. Because, mm. you know, most people I talk to in hockey that are on the management side or the coaching side, they, they're thinking five to seven years to fix this. Mm-hmm. That's not a quick rebuild. Oh, and no, I, absolutely not. I, I know your marketplace. I'm a huge fan of it. I love going there. I go to a, like my favorite restaurant to eat in the league is Original Joe's. There you go. You know, um, I used to love staying at the Fairmont Hotel. It's now bankrupt. You know, it was one of my favorite hotels in the league. I used to have some of the nicest breakfast there with the late great Pat Burns. I mean, I'm just telling you, I I really like the market. And when I see the building where it's at with, you know, seven to nine thousand people. And that's lucky, lucky for uh, an actual number. That's just just this year. Yeah. Where are we going to be next year? And how is that going to be enticing for free agents to go? And I, I love the fact that Shane talked about all the development people because all those guys you talked about, I know them all personally, and they're professional men. They're very, very professional at what they do. My concern is not on the development side. It's on the player procurement side. Mm. The art of team building is a really, really unbelievable gift to have if you're a management person. Some people get it. Some people don't. Mm-hmm. I, I think that is a fair point. Yeah. And I think that's something that um, I think that, yeah, I, I'm curious. Well, what Mike does because like, it's like, like I alluded to that. I think his first off season was better than this past off season in that specific team building uh, team building kind of uh, situation. But Keegan, I think I jumped in on you there. You were going to say, I, I, I really don't got much other than I think there is that, that aspect of, of team building. I, um, I think he's kind of struggling with how do you get the young superstar talent while also uh, like building a team up around your your current your current players. Like it, it's, it's tough. You really have to, or you end up at fourth overall in the draft instead of first overall. Like it, it feels just like a, a literal lottery for your franchise. <laughs> in this, kind of crazy. In this draft, in this draft, especially with their sense of familiarity with Boston University and all things Absolutely. Boston University, you're looking at. If you win the lottery, it's lead pipe since you're taking Macklin Celebrini. Mm-hmm. If you don't win the lottery, and let's say you slide to four, potentially five, let's just say sure. there's a player out there who's a Boston University tie-in, and that's basically your inside intel is from Boston University. That's where you're plugged in the most. And and so <laughs> you're probably going to take Cole Eisenman. And, and Cole, I can tell you guys right now, you take Cole Eisenman, I'll get on any podcast and go – because <laughs> he's he's a legitimate player. He's he, all he does is score. Yeah. That's all he does. Good goal scorer. And sure. I, I don't care what all the other stuff the scouts are saying. They're, I don't know why they're picking on this kid, but they're picking on this kid. They are. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. I'm just telling you, it's not fair. Mm-hmm. He's a really good player, and all he does is score. And I can tell you guys right now, I'm so comfortable saying this. I talked to a director of player personnel this morning before I came on with you guys, and he said, "Do you know much about Cole?" I said, "Yeah, I know a lot." He goes, we had him in for an interview. Their team had him in for an interview. He said, he was he knocked it out of the park. He's the best interview we had. Wow. He goes, why are people jumping down this kid's throat? I said, I have no idea. Hmm. Now, that's from a director of player personnel yeah. of, a, of a super high-end NHL team. Wow. So I'm going to tell you. Okay. Okay. Did the, uh, yeah, because he's kind of slid down a lot of lists, right? Like he was probably top yes. five getting the he was year. Considered and a, a potential number two at a certain point, right? Yeah, yeah. Shane's yeah. right. On. Potential number two, Shane's yeah. right on. Yeah. yeah. So I do wonder about that. I mean, you you look at him, you watch his tape. He's an amazing goal scorer, um, like one of the better ones in the past couple of drafts. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing in the NHL, probably. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he keeps sliding. I do. That's interesting to think about because the Sharks don't have a lot of those kind of types in their system and their prospects. That's why I brought his name up. 100%. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Well, I wanted to ask you guys now. You, you guys both alluded to it on 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 the podcast that we mentioned. Again, uh, listen listen to it. It's the March twentieth podcast of the mm-hmm. Eye Test. And uh, Jimmy, you said, and we've alluded to this already, that you know you got to get some guys in there, not just physically but mentally, to protect these kids when they come in, right? And Pierre, yeah. you made a focus on the, the the depth on the back end. So I totally agree with both of you there, and that's a big part of stabilizing what's what's going on here. So then I, it leads me to ask you guys: then, if you are the Sharks, what do you need to do? 
this summer, not necessarily to win the Stanley Cup next year, obviously, but <laughs> just to kind of, you know, put this, put this, put this uh, ship, not the rebuild, because we can, you can, I think we can agree that, you know, they're accumulating some picks. That's all good. Right. And they're, they're, they're getting rid of these big contracts. That's good too. Right. But yep. in terms of just next year and getting that part of the rebuild, the product on the ice right now in a better direction. And what, what would you guys realistically do this summer? You want me to take it here? You go, Jimmy. I'll take it yeah. off. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said on that podcast, uh, and I just said a few minutes ago, I, I would really put a focus on not just skill depth, but um, but veteran depth. And mm -hmm. I, I would build around these guys. And um, I'd also start to look at, you know, when we talk about depth, you, you're adding a ton of skill. You want to add as much skill as you can in the draft through prospects, you want to develop these guys, but I would also start to, I guess what I was getting at and why I was worried about this was, and Pierre alluded to it there is how do you get, how do you get those players to come mm -hmm. start to, to mark, think about how you're going to market yourself as a team. Um, and right now, what do you have to market to bring in guys through free agency? How are you bringing those guys in to, to help your younger players out? if they're looking from afar as we did, and I'm sure there's, they're thinking the same thing and they're not seeing a, a culture developing there. And I guess that's, I'm learning more from you guys, you know, talking today that maybe there is more of a plan than, than I originally thought, but oh, I we hope so. <laughs> we hope you see, but I don't want to cover a, a, a rudderless team for, for well, that, and that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I'm worried about there. Yeah. And I, I just I wonder, <laughs> and look, I, I know Mike, I graduated high school with Mike. I want him to do great, but we, we all agree he inherited a mess there. And I don't know, does he have a solid plan to, to fix that mess right now? Or is he doing it on the fly in some yeah. respects? Or is he and the, so that's um... what I'm interested in seeing is where does this plan go? Does it start to kind of come in into form here and, and go down and not look, no development path is linear. But does this at least go linear for a bit here um, and, and start to give everybody goals to attain, so to speak? I don't see that right now. I want to see it. And I think that's my main issue there. Is he more well, of the wrecking ball rather than the, the rebuilder? You know, like, is he the GM that's just in there to tear everything down and, and there's nothing else? Uh, right. Who knows? Yeah. His first job. So it's, it's hard to say what his track record is in that. Yep. He's got enough people around him that can help him. Timmy Burke's been in this league for a very long time. Dougie Waite's yep. been in this league for a very long time. Marshan Waite and Greer were all teammates in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not. I think it's wrong to blame them. Here's here's you asked me. Shane asked me what I would try to do th this off season. Mm -hmm. One of the number one things they need to address is goal differential. Okay, there are minus one thirty three. If you're you guys have no idea how bad that is. That's awful. Oh, I, I know. I at the beginning of the season, <laughs> historically, the first actually. eleven games, they were uh, on pace to be. It was they were like minus forty two uh, when they started off zero ten and one. And I love my math, and so you multiply that, they would have had a worse goal differential than the nineteen seventy four seventy five Washington Capitals. Washington Capitals, which is, uh, yes. all time worse minus two sixty five. They've actually improved greatly from since then. <laughs> yeah, no, I think Tommy McVie was a coach of that team in seventy four seventy five in Washington. Um, but no, my my point is they got to find a way to address that. Yeah. So I don't think they're going to be able to address it by scoring more. No. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to find a way to do it by addressing their defense. Yeah. And part of that is getting better players and being harder to play against. And I, I would be shocked. No, I, David Quinn used to work with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a huge fan. I, I tried to recruit Brian Wiseman before he went to the University of Michigan. Like, I know their people unbelievably well. Um, and I would say, David, I'm the only one on this podcast that saw him play. Um, so I would just tell you, right now, he, he was an elite defenseman. I saw him play at the Kent school first, then at BU before I got Christmas disease. So I've seen him for a long time and he worked with me at Europa cup for, I think three or four summers in Boston, elite, elite hockey person, tremendous guy. It's going to be about defense. I guarantee you there's not one meeting that he goes into with Mike Greer and Dougie mm -hmm. Wade and Timmy Burke, where he says, I got to get better defensemen. And if he's not, 
I'm going to call him up and tell him, you better start telling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you can't uh, with that defense. I don't care what you guys say. Mm -hmm. you, this is – that goal differential, and I bring it up to Jimmy all the time because most people don't understand how that's a real relevant illustration of where your team is as a, as a group. So I'll give you an example. It's in the Eastern Conference. Jimmy will tell you. Yep. I said there's only one chasing team right now, and this was three months ago, that has a legitimate chance to push for the last playoff spot, and it was the Pittsburgh Penguins. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, of all the chasing teams, they were the only ones that had a positive goal. Oh, yeah, field. no, I've seen that. Yeah. They, were the only, they were the only ones. And so, Shane, you're a math guy. So I'm watching that, and I'm going, okay, if they can continue that play, stay in a positive plane – uh, the goal differential, they'll have a chance to move up because it'll speak to their offense and it'll speak sure. to their defense. Sure. Well, then they cratered. They cratered. And they at one point, they were a minus goal differential. Yeah. They're well, one. Everybody's marveling how the Pittsburgh Penguins back in the hunt. Look at their goal differential. It's positive. It went from yeah. being a negative to a positive. Mm -hmm. So you ask me, how San Jose are you going to fix it? The number one thing, if they have veteran hockey people in that office, they're going to look at all their numbers and they're going to say, Holy moly, it's not that complicated. We've got to fix our goal differential. Yeah. That's not that's not sustainable in a rebuild. It's not. Guys, look at look at I mean that's that's a philosophy that stood the test of time, right? You can bring in all the other analytics, you can bring in everything. But that stat right there and then I think Pierre, you'll agree with me, you know, you look at championship teams when they finally reach the caliber where they want to be to to attain a Stanley Cup or contend all the time, they're built from the goal out. Yeah. They're not, you know, high flying forwards all the time that, you know, have deep defensemen that have a lot of minuses. They're built from the goal out. And I'm with Pierre hundred percent on this, that you need to start, you know, constructing your team to where you want to, like I said, get it, get that goal in mind mm -hmm. and start constructing it that way right now. I, I just feel like a lot of things like you guys said, they're, they're tearing it down. Right. That's what it feels like. It's just a lot of things are being tossed around and we'll see where it lands. I think you, you got to get to a point now in this offseason, you got plenty of cap space, figure out a way, like Pierre said, to build up that defense. And then, and then, you know, you're going to have a lot of high end offensive skill come in with prospects, right? When you think of Will Smith right now, but look at your defense, build that out so that there's a foundation there and, and build that team defense first mentality. That's on the coaching to do that. And I think, I think David Quinn would obviously be a good guy for that. So there's, there's potential there. I just want to see what is the plan. I don't know that answer right now. It seems like maybe you guys are a little unsure as well. And I think that's what we were getting at before this. If, if as currently constituted, mm -hmm. this goes forward the same way, then it's mm -hmm. going to be a very, very long rebuild. But if you start to put those pieces in place and it, like I said, it doesn't have to be a high-end skill guy in the back end. Just bring in a solid defensive backbone type guy, character guys. You're going to start to find that direction and move in the right way. Yeah, and part of the reasons why we, we had you guys on is like we kind of, at least Keegan and I, we have, a, 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 I guess, a, our perception is that people conflate uh, sort of what happened at the, the last regime, the end of the last regime with what Mike is doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why we weren't, we weren't totally clear uh, from your podcast, and that's why we, we have you on. You guys have yeah. made made your points uh, clear. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, though, about the defense and also free agents, uh, just uh, wanted, wanted to kind of put put this in, in your guys' ears. Before we get to, we have one more question for you guys, and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll let you guys go. Uh, but <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, the defense, that is also actually, if you go back to the offseason, another sort of you want to look at uh, how they constructed this team that was wrong. They clearly had no power play quarterback to start the season. They used Kyle Burrows in the first first 10 games as their pp1 now that and i actually asked mike about it in in training camp i think or during the off season because it was clear i just looked at the, anyone can look at the rosters and well you trade eric carlson okay of course okay you're not gonna get eric carlson back to replace uh, obviously norris trophy 100 point defenseman but who are you gonna have to just take that job and i mike was like eh, i'm not really sure <laughs> <laughs> and, and so at least he's honest uh, he was honest, and that's that speaks to sort of a uh, maybe I, I would say, Jimmy, to your point, that maybe there was a little bit uh, too much uh, during this past off season. The current roster, again, not the big picture planning of, uh, of of getting picks and prospects, but the 
the what the on ice product maybe a little bit too much of you know throwing some shit on the wall there uh in terms of uh, adding to this defense though one thing that mike has done i think uh uh, well, I think uh, what you guys think about this is uh, Mike has uh, given kind of uh, longer contracts to guys that people are like, oh, like they give four years to Matt Benning. Why would you give four years to Matt Benning? Uh, that would be uh, many people's reaction, right? But mm -hmm. the clever part of that to me is that Matt Benning's AAV is so low that so mm -hmm. he is a disaster and you, you yeah. just bury him and you, you don't lose anything on the cap and it just it just hustle plotters money. So that's that's fine, right? And yep. he did N Nico Sturm, same thing, three years, six million dollars. That seemed at the time maybe rich for uh, a guy that is you know very very good fourth line center. He's he's been a good good part of this. Kyle Burles did the same thing with him last year. Maybe gave him a year longer than I think other teams would have. And so that's one thing that Mike can do. That doesn't get you like the high high end guys like I say uh, Noel Hannafin, but that it's that's something that that maybe uh, that that maybe Mike can look to. Um, but anyway, last and question for you guys. Your, it convinces your um, your free agents to actually come to San Jose too. If you give them a longer uh, yeah yeah AV, then that's then, that's then that's are, the uh, incentive. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I like the Jan Ruda pickup too. By the way, I yeah. mean, I'm always been, a big fan of him. Yeah, yeah, he's no, been coming he's, on late. Greer likes to like it looks like buy low on a lot of guys like you got you know Kalen Addison when he, he recognized oh, sure. he didn't have a, a power play quarterback he he needed a guy to move the puck not that you know and Kalen's been good. But he's not. You know, he's not. Kevin I mean, Carlson, he's picked up but, like every yeah. every but, every uh, player from the 2017-18 draft that sort of hasn't really yeah. done well for his former team, Addison. I think he's just Zanina, trying to Zadina. Hoping yeah. one of these guys pop. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah hope it, one of them pops. He right? doesn't want to. It looks like yeah. as of now, he doesn't want to take the big swing to to really cement a, a long contract after he just mm. traded all of them. And I really right. wonder if this offseason is the one where he adds a defenseman that that he thinks can be there for the next five years kind of thing um it, it it's tough to think about but yeah because yeah, he, he's were, so basically been tearing it down that, the whole time. that they were interested in in hannafin really early on i think yeah you know, Elliot reported you know, that. You know, you know you yeah dream all you want oh i'm just yeah. saying that's like you know, Elliot reported it so, so, yeah, so here, here's the one thing like yeah. when i do these things yeah i'm talking to like somebody that's done the deals because i have yeah you can't dream about these. Like it's either going to happen or it's not. And so I don't care that Mike Greer went to St. Sebastian's and I don't care that Noah Hannafin went to St. Sebastian's. I don't care about any of that stuff. That means nothing to me. It doesn't mean anything to Noah Hannafin's representatives either. Sure. Are you going to win or are you going to lose? And yeah. if you're Noah Hannafin, you don't want to go to a losing team. You want to go That's to a fair. winning team. Yeah. So yeah. Where's he in? He's playing in Vegas now. Yeah. yeah. He went, he's going to be winning. Yep, and, and he's in a no and taxes either. And I'm just gonna say, he's, one of no, he's in a no tax state. Yep. And, and I, I don't know how much you guys talk about this, but I can tell you this right now. This is a serious thing. I lived in Montreal. I grew up in Montreal, and Montreal cannot get free agents to go there. And there's a reason why. They got a language issue, and they got a taxation issue. I'm not saying you guys have a language issue because you don't. You got a major taxation and cost of living issue. Absolutely. And yeah. if, if you're a guy that, and I can tell you, and I won't tell you the player's name. I know a player that played there and he made $2 million a year. And he told me how much he was saving every year. I was mortified. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a real issue. And it's not just San Jose. It's the LA Kings. It's, it's, um, sure. it's down in Anaheim. Sure. It's hard. And so these are issues that are ancillary issues but they matter when it comes to player procurement. Yeah. They matter a lot. And so, you know, everybody dreams about Noah Hannafin. Noah Hannafin would have been great. You know where Noah Hannafin should have been? Boston. Yeah. He should have been in Boston. They couldn't make it work. He's from Boston. Think about that. Yeah. He's from Boston. Yeah, also that blue line too. I mean, it just would have been a perfect fit. So he was never going to San Jose. I don't know who put that out there, but I was like, are you kidding me? Does anybody yeah. not read the room here? So. Yeah. Anyways, long story short, they got to make their defense better. Yeah, yep. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Do without Noah Hannafin, somehow. Yeah. Hannafin, Hannafin, Hannafin was the ideal, but obviously, but you're right though that, that even if you trade for him, like why would he stay? Right? With He's not staying. So, right. You know? Here, so this is. I'm going to use an example because it's a San Jose example. Mm -hmm. When you guys got Eric Carlson there, and I don't mean that you guys aren't part of the team, but you care, and I really respect that. That's the best part about hockey. People are passionate about their teams oh, yeah. and about their players. So you get Eric Carlson. You compounded the problem 
because you extended him the way you did, you should have let him go because you didn't win. You didn't win with him. It wasn't well, we made to the conference final, though. That's the part I argue. I mean, okay. You want to win the Stanley Cup or get to the conference final? Well, the conference final is a uh, step there, though. So maybe the next year you okay. win the Stanley Cup. I, I remember when Joe Thornton was there too, and they got to the conference final. The Chicago Blackhawks did a tap dance on him. Nobody cares. You either won the cup or you In didn't. Vancouver too. <laughs> you, won the cup, you either won the cup or you didn't. So where you compound the problem, Shang? And I'm just this is hard ass hockey stuff. Okay, yeah. this is how people talk in the managerial suite. Did you win or did you lose? You lost. Sure. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. So here's what I'm going to tell you. You know what you should have done? Should have let him go. Yep. Should let him go to t to Tampa where he was going to go play with Victor Hedman. Mm -hmm. That's what you should have done. So you didn't wouldn't have been buried, and then you would have kept Brent Burns, <laughs> and then you would have probably kept some other players. But yep. because you had to extend him to the dollar value that you did, and I know he won the Norris Trophy. I <laughs> I know Eric really well. <laughs> he he's one of the best number fifteen picks ever in the history of the NHL draft. He was fifteenth overall. He was a great pick, but he also won the Norris Trophy. He was minus, what, 23, 24? A lot of those are empty net goals, though. <laughs> 20, 21 of those. Shanks got the stats out. No, that's, no that's, that's what we talked about all last year. No. Actually, your guy, David Quinn, that's all he talked about when he was trying to push uh, Eric Quinn. Like, hey, 21 so of those 26. You would be such a good goals. agent. You would be a great agent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Good I actually work for the Sharks, guys. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love yeah. it. We can well, all we all know it's not Eric didn't win the, the Norris for his defense. That's not that's not what yeah, Eric won the Norris Eric for. Well, I acknowledge that too. So. Yeah. Oh, well, that was a great. I love that. There was empty net goals. I'm gonna call <laughs> all these agents. Say, There's a good argument for you. And are they, <laughs> hey, Kyle Dubas. Empty net goals in there. Did. You only need one guy to buy it, all right? So yeah, uh, you got Kyle. <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that 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 kind of speaks back to the Doug Wilson, uh, like his ideas that towards the end of his thing was to extend all these these players to these contracts yeah. to see if he could win. But it was always kind of a, a you know seems like a logical like fallacy because you didn't win with them. Like you didn't win the Stanley Cup after having all of these amazing players for fifteen years. Why are these sets going to do it? And it never really made sense. Keegan, that's so well said by you. I really respect yeah. what you just said. And that's basically the premise of my point. So I learned a valuable hockey lesson from a really smart hockey guy a long time ago, the late Bill Torrey, who was the architect of the New York Islanders teams. We were at the Hockey Hall of Fame talking together. And I, I said, Mr. Torrey, just a quick question. He said, Pierre, don't call me Mr. It's Bill. I said, okay, Bill. Um, what's the one thing you wish you could have done over? And he said, I loved all my players. And because I loved them all, I always overextended their contracts. Yeah. And he said, I wish I would not have done that. Mm -hmm. He says, not because I didn't like the players. I loved them. They won for me. I really respected them. I should have been harsher. I should have not been as, as giving. And I think that's where Doug got into trouble. Yeah. I do. Weird. Doug fell in love with his players, yeah. and the this is this is going to sound really harsh. Okay, this is a Scotty Bowmanism. One day I said I really love the player on our team, and he grabbed me and pulled me in his office. I was a young kid in the NHL. I think I was twenty nine. Yeah, this was in a meeting too, right? That you said in this a meeting, and yeah. he called me in his office, and he said, "Hey, don't you ever say that again." I said, "What did I say?" He said, you said you loved one of the players. I said, yeah. He said, the only time you love anything, and he stopped himself, and then he says, never love a hockey player. I said, why is that? <laughs> said, it's because they're like racehorses and ex-wives. All they're going to do is cost you money. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's true. <laughs> That's what he said to me, and I never yeah. forgot that. Yep. I, never yep. I think that happened with Chiarelli a bit when he was here. After uh, 2011, Pierre, I thought I kind of saw the same thing. I mean, look, Doug's not the first. He's not the last. Yep. that's going to do that. But that's the past. I'm looking to the future now with you guys. And, you know, as we were talking about the defense there, as you guys were just talking, I'm looking at that defense right now, guys. And It's brutal. I mean, how many of those guys on that blue line right now are more than a third-pairing guy? I mean – Maybe one, Ferraro, maybe. Yes, but not everybody thinks that. Some people think yeah. he's a guy. So yeah, yeah. 
So for for our to me, like I know him from UMass Amherst. I spent a lot of time there. You know, Jimmy knows um, their coach, Greg Carvel, is one of my yeah. guys, and I'm a huge fan of him. And I think he's an amazing developer of talent. Yeah. And he says the same thing I do. Mara Ferraro is a keeper. Like he's a keeper. Yeah. yeah. So there's one out of six. Yeah. I've known Mark Edward Vlasic since you know uh, Ronnie Wilson came up with the name Pickles. You yeah. know. I'm not so that he was 18 years old. Gord Miller and I used to go do all the San Jose Shark games, and I used to hear Ronnie, yeah, Pickles is this and Pickles is that. And Ronnie was right, Pickles was really good. He was yeah, really good. yeah. he's he not Vlasic than he anymore, though. But he's he's old now, yeah, and he's got miles on him. He's not the same player anymore, and that stuff happens. Um, so that's the problem. There's just not enough, and that's why when you asked me what I would do, I wouldn't even worry about the forwards this year, yeah. I'd, my identification would be all about how do we make the team better defensively. Yeah. Yep. Agree with that. It's a last one for, for you guys. And we talked about Eric Carlson and that, but I want to go back, not that far back, uh, but let's, I want to assume all that happened with uh, the end of the Doug Wilson regime. And so the last one for you guys is anything else you would have changed differently of how you would have handled the rebuild. If you're Mike Greer. So let's say you're hired in summer 2022. Um, and this is you. You get this situation, uh, and so what? What? What would you guys have done differently, maybe in the last couple of years? Go ahead, Jimmy. I think I just told. You, I mean, I just would like we're just saying right now. I would have focused more on uh, character and defense. Mm, fair, okay. So I would have definitely looked at the goaltending position. Uh, I would have definitely added more sandpaper. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'd really focus in on, and I'm sure they have, San Jose was called the shark tank for a reason. It was a freaking hard place to go. You go Absolutely. look at the numbers. One night I came in there with a team. We had lost the night before, I think, in overtime in Anaheim. It was a really tough back-to-back. -to -back. I think we started at 5 o'clock the next day. We got pulverized. We didn't just get beat. We got mauled. We got destroyed. And uh, I remember looking at one of my assistants, I think it was Paul, it was Paul Gillis. And I said, Gilly, this place is a house of horrors. Like it's a hard place to play, <laughs> you know? And every year I'd go back there, San Jose had an identity. Yeah. It was a hard place to play. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. No. Yep. So you asked me what I would do. I'd make it a really mean place to play. Mm. Really, yep. really mean place. Even if, even if you're, even if you're not going to do great in the standings, just b keep building that identity, right, Pierre? Sure. Yeah, and I, I'm David. This has got to be killing David. David. Yeah. Oh, it, it has. Oh, we sure. see it in the post games. He's, yeah. he's, he <laughs> looks miserable sometimes. I don't, know how much you guys, I don't know how much you guys talk to him about it away from the bright lights and the microphones, but you're not going to find a more honorable guy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find a smarter guy. And you're not going to find a more passionate guy than David. And and I again, I go back to Brian Wiseman when he was a kid playing for the Chatham Micmacs. When I tried to recruit him out of Chatham, Ontario, before he went to the University of Michigan, and I'll never forget the call when he called me up. Wiseman called me up and he said, "Coach, I'm committing to Michigan." We both started crying on the phone at the same time. I'm just such a big fan of that guy. He's an amazing hockey person. You got Quinn and Wiseman, just two really, really good hockey guys. They must be going nuts. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and out of respect, I have not texted either one of them because I respect them so much. I didn't want to say, you know, what's going on here? What's going on? Because I don't think it's appropriate. You know, having sure. I've walked in their shoes before, but I would tell you, coaching's not a problem there. Coaching's not a problem. I don't think the GM is a problem. I don't. I don't. I don't think the development stuff that Cheng talked about is a problem. I think it's the vision. It's the yeah. vision. How, what do we want to be? And, you know, Shane, you talked about throwing poop against the wall. Mm -hmm. You can't. You need to be, this is what we're going to be. Sure. We're not going to be here one day and there the next. We're going to be, boom. Yeah, and I think he uh... locked out the noise. Well, yeah. I have to ask you, though, isn't the vision Mike, or is that more the uh, Mike and the ownership? But the, best, the best teams I've ever seen run, the manager has a vision. And he surrounds himself with people that aren't afraid to argue with his vision. Mm -hmm. He empowers the people around him to say, your vision is great here and it's great here, but it's faulty here. Mm -hmm. We have to fix that. Sure. Craig Patrick, I'm telling you guys, 
I had the privilege of working for him. He hired me. I've never seen a better guy when it comes to empowering his people and not not taking stuff personal. If you say you're wrong here, mm. yeah, absolutely. And and that's I can tell you, the Penguins forever were great because of Craig Patrick. Sure. I know they had great players, but he's the one that got them. I'm telling you, this guy was phenomenal. He was phenomenal to work for. I'm just telling you. I think the vision so far for me has only been the teardown, like I said. And and, and I guess that brings up, would you guys have traded Tomas Hurt? Would you have moved Tom? No, not, the way, not the way they did. Not the way they did. No, that just the, uh, not the way they did. You know, you ironically. Just the, the return or, or to Vegas themselves or what was it? The, the, retur- the return mm-hmm. to Vegas yeah. themselves. But, guys, it, it's hilarious because when I see that trade and what they got mm-hmm. back, I immediately thought back to a heist that Doug Wilson pulled, and that would be <laughs> Joe Thornton. Sure. And it just seemed like it, with Hurdle, it was like they just took the first offer they got. I don't know. I, that's just me speculating. I, I'm going to like this is going to be a no whole other topic. So I don't want to keep you guys forever. Yeah. I, I really like that trade. The, my main points for it. And maybe maybe I do work for the Sharks, guys. Jesus. Maybe you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, there's, like, a lot of where's the, like, there's like a teal like banner yeah. unfurling behind me as I speak. But OK, so these are the two main points. I was you like that trade. Huh? Wow. I do. OK, so. He's mainly because it's not. I love Tommy Hurdle, the player. I have a picture of Tommy right here. So, <laughs> anyway, um, love him as a player, but he is he's a 30 something player with six years left on his contract. Those are not players that get good returns back. I mean, I can't, I couldn't, I, I have not done my full research on this, so you guys might be able to bust me on it. So, but I don't okay. know of a 30 something star player with a lot of term left. That get that got that has gotten a lot back in a trade. The only guy I could think of in my kind of cursory research was Shea Weber. He got back PK Subban, right? But of course, Shea Weber. A couple of things about Shea Weber. Shea Weber was an elite, elite player, right? Tommy Hurdle is a very, very good player, but he's not an elite, elite center. And so I think that's one difference I could see there. But in terms of just like those kind of players, like look how hard it was to trade Eric Carlson, right? Guys like that are just so hard to trade uh, uh, on those contracts. Or let's say Philadelphia tries to trade a Couturier this summer, right? It's just going to be really hard because people look at that contract, they look at the term left, the age of the player, and they just won't give up a lot. And so when you get what it, two first round picks for him and the Vegas one, everyone assumes that the 2025 unprotected pick is going to be, oh, it's going to be the 30th pick of the draft. It may well be, but of course, that's what, the Sharks lot when they traded their 2020 pick to Ottawa Senators for Eric Carlson. And mm-hmm. they assumed that that was going to be, oh, it's going to end up in the 20s, the third, the thirties. It's fine. Right. And ended up being Tim, Tim Stutzla, the third pick of that draft. So, so anyway, those are the, 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 the main parts that, uh, uh, the, the main reasons why that you just don't get, uh, get a lot for a 30 something player, no matter how good he is right now. And again, Tommy Hurdle, amazing player right now, even better off the ice. Totally agree on all that. But you don't get a lot for players like that with a lot of term left. There's just too much risk associated. And to get two first-round picks back for it, I think, is excellent. Shane, let me ask you a question. What else did you pay with Tommy Hurdle to get those picks? Oh, sure. So, see, to me, that's the cost of not trading him two years ago like you should have. Because if you trade him two years ago, you would have got their round picks back. And, of course, you wouldn't have to retain the money. But I would argue with the retention, though, that even though they retain for six years, which is kind of – I mean, that's like uh, – you don't you don't see that a lot. Ekman Larson's the example of that. But you, that's, that's terrible. You hate that. But it is for just uh, $1.387 million. And that is – you know, that's that's pretty close to the – that's – double veterans minimum right now yes. um, rising cap and whatnot. I don't think that's that much per year. And again, that leads back to what I said earlier that in a couple of years, they're going to be flush with cap space. So, so the question is what they're going to do with it. No, that, and, that's, fair. that's fair. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. And then the third round picks, I mean, like, and I don't know what you guys think about this, but third round picks are good picks. I'm not, I'm not arguing that, but they are sort of, you can get those back. You know, what they traded a 2025 third, a 2027 third, right? The 2027 third, they're going to get back in, uh, probably multiple uh, 2027 third round picks within a couple of years. The 2025. How are they going to do that? Trading infrastructure? Is that what you're saying? Well, no, no, trading like uh, Anthony Duclair type. They got a third for Anthony. Yeah, yeah, no, I know that. Okay, so you're saying they're trading, you're trading assets then. You're trading. Yeah, you know, you'll trade, you'll trade some, some, okay. some guy yeah. to, to, to get it back. Well, so, so thirds are good picks, but again, if you look at like sort of the premium assets of it, Tommy Hurdle, obviously the player he is right now, that's a premium player, premium asset. David Edstrom, first, uh, the first pick, first round pick 
the, of the last uh, last draft for the Golden Knights. The last pick of the draft, granted, but still, he's a guy who's had a really good year, from what I understand. Yeah. And and then uh, 2025 first round pick, so that's two premium assets back. I think that's pretty good for again a 30 something player with an injury history too. Let, let's let's add that with six years left on his contract. I just don't think. Last last season, Tommy Hurdle did not have a good season. You weren't going to get a trade like this last uh, last season. For no, me. I agree with that. I agree with that. So what, let me ask you this. If Vegas wins the Cup next year or this year, is it still a good trade? Yeah, I think it's, it's you're rolling the dice. I mean, you can't – when you make the trade, you have no idea, obviously – what Vegas is going to do. You obviously suspect with how gung ho they are that they're going to do well. I mean, that's obviously so like odds are that pick is going to be the 2025 pick is going to be a late pick, but you know, you leave that window open obviously by, by making Vegas accept the, you know, giving him unprotected that you never know. Right. These veteran mm -hmm. teams, right. Obviously we saw with the sharks, we see with the penguins this year, right. These veteran teams, you just, you never quite know when the bottom's going to fall on them just a little bit. Right. And so maybe that pick becomes a uh, 15th pick or whatever. Right. And all of a sudden that pick looks a lot better. So you, you don't know about that, but yeah, I think uh, based on the, information they have now and the trade that they made i think uh, it's a, it's a good trade and i'm not really sure i know a lot of people said that this off season if they had made hurdle available that they were going to have these offers and people would have traded more and people would have not demanded retention i, I don't really know like i, I if, well people I, will say that but they don't know either yeah so yeah they, they, I, that's what i feel like to that, i'll see you to that point 100 yeah yeah teams will demand retention because you can because you have the sharks over the barrel a little bit in the sense that they really want to get rid of this contract and their team is not going anywhere and hurdle wants out too and so yeah so all all these things combined like i again i okay. i will i will stick that even if david estrom bust even if that pick next year is like the, the 30th pick and that that pick isn't very good just based on values now of two first round picks right now for an aging asset like tommy hurdle i think it's a good trade all right Build up your defense. Let's go to work. Yes, I agree. We agree on that fully. That's that's what we agree with. So. All right. Good point, Shane Greer. <laughs> Shane Greer. Yes. yes. <laughs> so my I, career's I, long I'm lost son. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, I can do many, many things. So yeah. We I'm are noted, a Mike Greer. And I guess we, uh, we should also mention that's we're right. we're the we're the. Um, well, I'm the fan that is like a Mike Greer apologist. There's lots of fans that are not that that are kind of uh, wondering what he is doing. What, like, I'm kind trying of to be objective. I, I think. But no, I think you, you're, I think you're it, it, tilted you're best, a little bit. You're one of the best in our network. I'll tell Pierre that. I mean, I know Pierre's yeah. not as familiar with you, but Shane's probably one of the best writers. Absolutely. In the National Hockey. Well, I had a great time with both Keegan yeah. and Shane. I think it was a great exercise. I'm really grateful for it. No, I, yeah. Anytime you do these, you should try to learn something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I do see that trade differently now. I do. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I do. I, I don't agree with the trade, but I do see it differently. There's no question I do. Um, but I think both Keegan and Chang have, have illustrated a lot of good things. So this has been a fruitful exercise for me, for sure. Oh, I really appreciate you guys coming on. You know, I know coming on, you know, debating, challenging you guys, but I think it's a, <laughs> it's great, a great exercise. I learned a lot too. Absolutely. And thank you so much, guys, for for coming on. Uh, definitely listen to uh, the eye test. So, uh, when do you guys have that on? Is that a weekly? Every podcast? day, four to every five. Day. Monday every to day? Friday, four to five. Yep. Oh, holy shit! I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're on every day. It's going great. So I got to keep Jimmy out of the local pub. <laughs> yeah, right. Got the happy hours. It's it might be a better there. podcast if it's from the pod. Well, Shepard, we've like, always I mean, done that. We just did one in Hurley, in Mon Montreal. So that yeah. was uh, that was a ball. All right, man. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks all right, for guys. Have a good one. All right. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.